All right, so technical difficulties as always when we go live, uh, but we're gonna try this again. All right, here we go. Let me go ahead and flip the phone over. All right, so we got Trevor Jaffe here. I've known this man for nine years. One of, uh, one of the strongest individuals I know. Deadlifts over 800 pounds. When we first met, I watched him deadlift 700 pounds, and also he hook grips, yeah. which is yeah. amazing, by the way. Uh, so what we want to do today is go over the deadlift and other variations, yep. correct? Conventional sumo and penlay row to build position and thoracic extension. Okay, and why would somebody just want to build their deadlift? Obviously, it's the biggest thing for your body as far as how much load you're going to use in total body strength. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of fight sports and just even powerlifting in general has a lot of posterior chain dominance where we're using the backside of our body to either accelerate us forward as a fighter or to be able to hold somebody else's weight or load. So these are things that we're going to be able to use that are very transferable to all aspects of life, whether it's just general living or sport in general. Uh, it's obviously where the biggest part of my total comes from for powerlifting because last comp poll is 815. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got records in three different divisions. But this is the lift that really makes or breaks a powerlifter because mm -hmm. we always joke that the, uh, the, the competition doesn't start until the bar hits the floor because it's the equalizer for a lot of people if they have a very mm -hmm. big deadlift. And obviously you don't need to be the best deadlifter in the world for MMA or fight sports, but having a good strong deadlift can certainly transfer over to your total usable strength inside of either a ring or a cage, you know, however you're fighting. Nice. Because if anyone's hanging on you and you need to posture up, yep. that's coming from your deadlift strength. For sure. And hip strength. All right, so what are we doing now? All right, we're going to go over cues of conventional first, and then we'll go over cues of sumo second. So the biggest mistake people make when they conventional deadlift is they just try to rip the bar off the floor. They bend their arms, they don't elongate their arms, and they just think about lifting the bar instead of leveraging their body back. An ideal position is going to be right underneath the armpits, knees a little bit over the bar. Back in the day, they used to teach vertical shins, and you would sit back, and that was all posterior chain, mm -hmm. which isn't a bad thing, but it doesn't give you a lot of leverage and force. We want to use as much leg as possible, as well as the thoracic extension, and minimize low back loading. It will be involved, but it should be a stabilizer, not a prime mover. Hmm. So the way we're going to achieve that is placing the bar over midfoot. And then you see a lot of people do this where their hips come up and they come back that way. That's a poor starting position and a poor distribution of load. Yep. So we want to have that bar over midfoot. And the way we're going to avoid that is getting thoracic extension. So I'm not arching my low back. I'm picking up my sternum and pulling my ribs backwards. This is thoracic extension where the sternum comes up only and the low back position doesn't change. So whether I hook or mix, you'll see that tension come from here. The bar's already off the floor just from my upper back tension. The way I'm doing that is I'm scooping the bar in and pulling this backwards only and not even changing this. Mm -hmm. And then what that's going to allow me to do is the chest and hips rise at the same time. Everything comes forward into the bar, which is the posterior chain coming forward and using, using the quads to drive down, the adductors and glutes to drive in and my upper back to pull back. As many muscles as possible is how we get the strongest. Mm -hmm. That's called integration. These are what our movement patterns there. We don't basically isolate. Like you wouldn't curl somebody into submission, you pull somebody into submission. Integration of as many muscles as possible. So if I did that hook grip, everything together, it starts from this position, upper back, and then I'm with the legs. But what we're doing is working on doing that simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Upper back tension, leg drive at the same time. I pull my upper body up, I push my lower body down. That lift is both push and pull. Now that gets a little trickier with sumo. Because with sumo, we have to make sure that we don't go into an anterior pelvic tilt because then we're going to have a hard time locking out because we're really driving more from legs than we are from upper body. Mm -hmm. So if I take my sumo stance, one thing you're going to notice obviously besides the wider stance, is pelvic position. When we start that bar, I'm going to shoot my pelvis inward towards the bar, and then when I get that thoracic extension, this is gonna pop off the floor. Yep. So, if I'm having my butt back, it may look like this position, but see this back butt away from the bar? I have no leverage. That's gonna end up like this. It's really hard to lock out from here. Mm -hmm. Watch what happens when I tuck my pelvis into the bar with the upper back tension. Hold on, Greg, hold on. Okay. Try it again. As soon as I tuck my pelvis in, this bar is going to come all the way up to my knees at this weight. I'm already in a lockout position from here. That's way easier to lock out. And all I had to do was squeeze my quads. Yeah. And as most of you know, if I came to a squat rack, I can unwrap a thousand pounds. So if I get the bar here, mm -hmm. this is a really easy lockout from there. And that literally just came from pelvic position. Yep. Staying out of the interior, scooping in the posterior, making sure I still pull my ribs back. You'll see that from here. I'll do both. So anterior, my hips are away. Posterior, my hips are in. Look how that changes my torso angle. Yep. And I can drive through. We, we see a lot of that. 
uh, with the over, like, overemphasizing the arch. Yes. Right? And I think that's been overplayed in a lot of ways. Yes. And I think you were the first person to show me how to hover ah, in the yeah. beginning. Hover right? I was young, so and I remember that. Cues came from geared powerlifting where they're in multi-ply gear, triple-ply gear. Mm -hmm. They can't reach the bar, so they have to make accommodations, and they're also riding with supportive equipment. Mm -hmm. Raw powerlifting has taken off, and so the mechanics are a little different. We understand how to transfer force from anterior chain to posterior chain. Yep. There's a little bit more anterior chain loading in sumo because we're using more quad drive and more core than in conventional. Gotcha. So now that we know how to sumo, now that we know how to conventional, what are some of the things that you look for when, let's say we have a weak point or you're a sticking point inside the deadlift? The weak point nine out of 10 times is someone's starting position and inability to create thoracic extension and hold the core. So one of the things we can practice doing is literally, I'll pick these plates up and we'll do a pen leg row. Mm -hmm. This is named after Glenn, Glenn pen leg. Uh, he didn't invent it. <laughs> he just popularized it. <laughs> he was a weightlifting coach. And he had all of his athletes pull their weight from dead stop on the floor. So traditionally you would see a bodybuilder do bent rows like this. The pen lay row was every rep came from the floor and you started with engagements of the lats. Yep. So you turned your arms into the bar, because weightlifters will do that, they'll extend their shoulders into extra rotation, which mm -hmm. pulls their sternum up. So they're gonna rotate before they row into their body and they're coming to their chest. Mm -hmm. So this is gonna lock the body still, they have to brace their core. They can take their deadlift grip position, and as I turn and tighten, the bar is already out. Yep. Row, and back down. Turn and tighten, bar up. So what we're working on is, this is being held static. We're learning how to create force in that position, which if you look at it, mimics my conventional stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of load in the hamstring, so if I just take that comp stance, turn and pull through, and row, I'm learning how to create upper back and lat tension that mm -hmm. I can just transfer through to my legs. Mm -hmm. So I'm creating tension on the bar first. We call that pulling up the slack. Now what that means is leaving no space, creating so much tension between you and the bar it starts to lever against the bar upwards, and then all you have to do is push the floor away. What should somebody do to pull the slack out of the bar? What should they be focusing on? Tension in the lats and in the shoulders. So your lats connect from shoulder to hip. That is what anchors them together. That's what keeps you from going into that posterior anchor tilt too much. We're always looking for a neutral zone. So if someone were to reach down the floor as hard as they can, mm -hmm. they will feel tension through their teres major, through the lat, all the way down to the glutes. If I told you to push the floor, Glutes are going to contract. Lats are going to contract. That's all one unit now that we can pull together. Mm -hmm. So Perfect. you've locked the whole torso into one unit. Gotcha. Okay, so let's say somebody's missing at the top of the deadlift. Then they have to fix their start. Okay, easy enough. Yeah. <laughs> if you're missing at the top, you are in a poor position from the start. Okay. It's like throwing a punch off balance. There's no power behind it. Yeah. So you have to set it up with the right position. So mm -hmm. how you start... It's how you finish. Cool. Any special exercises or supplemental lifts that you do uh, for your deadlifts? Yeah, of course. There's a straight leg deadlift, which is where we're only using hips. Mm -hmm. So the straight leg deadlift is conventional stance or sumo, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But what we're going to do is, I'm going to have a slight flex in the knees so they're not in a dangerous position. We don't want them locked. Yeah. Slight flex, and then I'm going to tension the lats and torso, and then basically, I'm using no quad drive in that. So that's going to be posterior side predominantly. Yeah. So that same tension from the pen layer up, just to here and back. Each one dead stop again. Because I'm teaching myself to create tension through the body mm -hmm. before I'm using the back half of the legs, not the front half of the legs. So that's a gotcha. stiff leg deadlift. Dead stop every time. Cool. So we got the pen lay row, right. we got the stiff leg deadlift. deadlift. Anything else? Absolutely. Mobility and stability is everything. Mm -hmm. So I love a single leg RDL where basically I'm just gonna point the back toe towards the front toe, other arm off the balance, and just push it through. Because the more I can stabilize my pelvis and learn how to use my adductors, you're going to see my foot pruning. When I go back, it's going to go out. It's going to go out when I go back. When I want to come in, it's going to pronate down, which is driving from the adductors. So our hips go through a lot of internal external rotation. Mm -hmm. During these movements, we want to get strong at them and stable. Look at that. A power lifter doing a single leg <laughs> deadlift. I like every it. Every warm up, every time. It's nice. Yeah. So sets and reps for your supplemental lifts. What are you thinking? No. Usually, we're gonna have, if you're really, really strong, right. low reps and low sets for the big movements, the deadlifts, right? Yep. The other one, supplemental, we're probably gonna put more into a hypertrophy range, so it might be anywhere from three to five sets of somewhere between like six to 12 reps. Try to put a little bit more emphasis on time under tension, practice, positions, 
I like to use inverted volume for the big lifts, which is more sets and lower reps. Mm -hmm. So you can just work on technique all the time. It's especially good for a fighter because you can do that at a work capacity rate, like shortened time intervals. Mm -hmm. So six sets of three with 60 seconds rest, I'd say 80%. We're gonna get a work capacity benefit, we're gonna get a skill set benefit, and we're gonna get a strength benefit. Cool. Now, how many times a week should somebody want to, well, let's say somebody wants to work their deadlift and get stronger there. How many times a week? I know this is kind of a general. general right? Yeah, but so how many times a week would you say for somebody beginning to start to lift? So we can look at this as a hinge pattern work rather than a deadlift pattern work. So we can have one main day where they're doing the actual competition style deadlift, mm -hmm. and the secondary day of the week can be just a hinge pattern. That might be the stiff leg deadlift or a barbell good morning or glute ham raise. Mm -hmm. We're still getting the hinge pattern in there. So I would call it like 1.5 times a week. It's once a week we're doing the main lift, and the other half of the week we're doing a variation that's very similar or just mm -hmm. focuses on that hip hinge pattern. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Anything else that you want to add to that? <laughs> uh, you're not strong unless you deadlift a lot. That's it. Don't care what you bench. <laughs> Don't care what you Show me what you deadlift. That's what, we, that's what we go off of. Yeah. All right. All right, man. So there it is. Make sure you follow my man. What's your Instagram again, Trevor? At Jaffe Strength. At J A F F E. Cool. All right. Thanks again, man. We're going to go ahead and post this up and then we'll probably do some more stuff later on. So stay tuned. Thanks.